I think it's fair to say that many girls dream of being on Broadway. Well, for Laura Osnes, that dream became reality. She starred in the Broadway revival of Grease at age 21. She even received a Tony Award nomination for her performance as Bonnie in Bonnie and Clyde. For Laura and her husband, photographer Nathan Johnson, it was a fairy tale of a life in New York. In fact, Laura even played Cinderella on Broadway. Then COVID hits and Laura and Nathan's world was turned upside down. Theirs is a story about the ugliness of cancel culture. But more importantly, it's a story of hope, of surviving being canceled and what life looks like on the other side. Laura Osnes and Nathan Johnson join me next on The Big Picture with Brett Craig. I lived among the woke, rising to the top of the advertising world until they cast me out because I wouldn't bow down to the woke mob. That led me to the Daily Wire, where I got a close-up look at the conservative side. And the one thing that I've learned is politics are not the answer. Only Jesus is. Welcome to the big picture. Don't forget to subscribe to the big picture with Brett Craig. I'll be right back. Laura Osnes and Nathan Johnson, welcome to the big picture. And so, okay. I remember when I first met you, just going back. And we'll, we'll get back to this, how it, we're going to get to the backstory of all this. But I first met you in a cafe in Franklin. That's you and right. Nathan. That's right. I, I don't think I knew who you were at the time, but my common friend of ours um, invited me to come meet with you. And my memory of that was just that it was, um, it was a really tearful conversation mm -hmm. where I probably talked more than you because I was thinking about my own challenge. But we I just, were in very similar situations. Situations, yeah. And yeah, I just remember it being really tearful and really hard. And I don't think I realized at the time. So I don't, when, when did we meet? Was that like... Um, that was probably uh, a little bit over a year ago. Right? I was just, I was going to say about a year ago. It was probably yeah. early 2022. 2022. So yeah. m my point is, it had just happened, right? I think that was the thing, like, I, just even talking to Jennifer Say earlier today, you know, she's one year in. Yeah. I'm going on three years in June. So this had just happened when we sat down. My, my cancellation was essentially <laughs> August of 2021. Okay. So it had been three, four months. Three, four probably. months. Yeah. yeah. More four, five. So I want to get to how all that happened, but I want to go backwards uh, and start with who you are, because I think for people to understand what cancellation is about or how it feels, mm -hmm is they have to understand you a little bit. Hmm. And so let's start from the beginning. How did you get to Broadway? It's like, that's just an amazing thing. I talked to my wife about it. I'm like, she was on Broadway. <laughs> oh, I have a very charmed story and I don't underestimate that. I appreciate it. I'm grateful for it every day. I came out of the womb singing, dancing and acting. It's something I've always really loved, yeah. storytelling. I had a gift for it. I think my parents saw that and encouraged me in that direction. Yeah. And I worked a lot professionally in Minneapolis growing up. I'm from Minnesota, and it happens to be a really good theater town. I started taking dance lessons and voice lessons, and I started. I knew I wanted to pursue it at a college level. So you just watching shows and stuff as a little girl, you just, it sparked something in you? I think that's it, yes. I grew up watching the old Rodgers and Hammerstein movies and Disney movies and The Wizard of Oz and all of these old movie musicals. And I had the soundtracks to the album, so I would put them in and act them out in my living room. And I don't know, it was something I always gravitated towards and knew that I knew that that's what I wanted to do with my life. And so, um, yeah, I, what ended up happening is that I won a TV reality show in 2007 wow. that cast me as Sandy in Greece on Broadway, to make a long story short. So I was 21. I had left college and had just started working in Minneapolis. It was like an like America's... Got talent kind of thing. Exactly. Or? I was like, Mer yeah, American, American Idol. Idol type. Yeah. And we performed live on TV every week, and the the winners got to be Sandy and Danny in Greece on Broadway. So I think that was why I did it. Because was that just overwhelming? I mean, yes, it was crazy. I had this like kind of push to be like, go, you should do this. Like yeah. I had this inner peace about doing it, taking the leap and doing it. And, what and you it? were playing Sandy. At a, at a theater okay. in, in Minneapolis Minnesota. at that time. So it kind of felt like a natural totally. transition for you. What is it like, like on Broadway, just in terms of like, the, like, so you went from a smaller thing to the big stage. What is the nerves like being on Broadway? I mean, because it's huge, right? Like, it's wild. Like, it, it is. I mean, 
Yes, it is. There's a lot more pressure, you know, and it's a lot more people and you're being reviewed in the New York Times and right. people are traveling from all over the world and spending hundreds of dollars to see you perform. So there's a whole there's a whole other level of pressure that comes with that. And then social media came into play and everyone feels like they know you and they expect a selfie at the stage door and all of that. But at, at the beginning, it really was just a joy. I mean, I, I honestly felt like this was my calling. This was my purpose. This is what I've always wanted to do. And I got to do it. So cool. And um, honestly, the work is the same. Whether what I, you know, playing a, a community theater production and then getting to do it on Broadway, there's just more money behind it. And my costumes were custom made for me instead of pulled from, you know, the cage that existed backstage that had been worn for years and sure. years before. But the work was the same, the process was the same, and I just, I found so much joy in it. So cool. Yeah. I want to play a quick clip. We just grabbed one, and you will not be able to hear it, so we're just going to watch it, but sure. they will hear it when we put this thing out there. So let's take a look at it real quick. <laughs> like, hmm, which one? <laughs> What does it That's feel great. like looking at that now? I mean, just, is it like another life or? It's, it's bittersweet. Mm -hmm. And I'm, being this far removed from it, um, there was a time where like all of my Broadway memories, I recently wrote a song about it actually, mm -hmm. kind of turned black and white in my memory. And even the good moments, even mm -hmm. the beautiful, beautiful thing mm -hmm. and season that that was, was kind of tainted because of this horrible experience. And I'm now finally beginning to watch that again and be like, that was really special. And that was beautiful for what it was. And that was a great, I, what a season, what mm -hmm. a moment. And uh, so I, I'm, it's bittersweet. Processing. It's bittersweet, processing, yeah. still healing. <laughs> that was from what, Bonnie and Clyde? No, that was a musical called Bandstand, a brand new original musical. Um, that was a great show. About a group of World War II vets that came home from the war and started a swing band. That's cool. Yep. All right, so you're, my understanding is you're going job to job. You're never, you're never not working. I was very grateful to have a, a pretty steady career, whether between Broadway shows I was doing concerts or uh, started doing Hallmark movies yeah. and working fairly consistently. So you start getting a little bit of a movie. Yeah, some TV film experience and nice. yeah. Hallmark. And you're doing a photography studio. Yeah, a photography that studio. Going? That was going awesome. We, uh, we, I shot that image, yeah, actually. But, um, yeah, Nate I, does all my photos. I was doing a lot of, a lot of that, that Broadway advertising, that sort of thing, and show posters, and that was, that was fun. And we, so we got to, our lives got to intersect in that way. Yeah, um, he'd shot the, the bandstand cover as well of yeah. me at the microphone that we... And used. Bonnie and Clyde and, mm -hmm. yeah, a couple others. But, um, yeah, it was, it, was, it was great. It was a great experience in New York. It was a lot of fun, exciting work to sink your teeth into. Uh, so... Tell us the story real quick, because yeah. I, I think I've heard it, but I want them to hear it again. Yeah. How did you guys meet? How oh, does man. this happen? How did, I want to hear about this. Sure. We actually met, we, uh, I did a show after college, and um, we did a show in Minnesota. It was, a musical. Yeah, it was a musical, and uh, she was the understudy for the lead female role. I was the understudy for the lead male role. And one day, the leads collided, first scene, he, they backed up into each other and they turned around and his tooth hit her in the forehead and she starts just <laughs> bleeding, just like, it was he bad. He chipped his tooth in half. Broke it in half. And, and a hard forehead. Uh, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so the two of us went on after, uh, after that first scene, they brought them to the hospital. And so we, uh, we Our went first on kiss was on stage <laughs> and we started dating a couple days later. I think we kind of had a thing for each other. No, we abs I absolutely had a thing for you. I so, that's the thing, like, <laughs> help me with that a little bit, because I'm yeah, not an sure, actor. Sure. Kissing people in scenes, kissing yeah. people on stages. Yeah. So you have a thing for Laura. She doesn't know it yet, maybe, or maybe she does, but you have to kiss her. Like, that's a different kind of kiss. Yes. But was, okay, so. <laughs> that's part of the story. Me, yeah, that, you know, after I, I went back to the, the guy's dressing room, and I was, they were like, what? And I'm like, I know, right? Well, so for Laura, we talked a couple days later, and I was like, hey, babe, how, how about that? Well, when we started dating, I was yeah, like, yeah. how about that kiss? She's like, what? 
I was like, you know, that kiss, you know, the one with rose petals falling down. She's like, that was business. I was like, good. So for job. you, you were not. Oh, I mean, I'm there. sure. I'm very professional. Totally. I am not so professional. Do you get apparently. to that point, and I'm just not, to, I want to hear the rest of that, but, but to where you just can kiss people, because I'm seriously, it's like a question people have. Oh, totally. You don't feel anything. You just, it's total. I mean, I'm, not, I'm no longer an actor, and that's probably one of the reasons, because I'm, I'm <laughs> just, no, and I'm half joking, but um, yeah. for me, it was like, you know, I really did care for this person. For you, it's, but that was, that was uh, I always, was able to trust her because yeah. she's like, you know what? No, like this is, this is, this is business, and I'm going to be able to shut that off. I, I'm an actor. I can. I um, think if I'm going to speak on that for a second, I think I've always found it very valuable to develop a trust and a camaraderie and a friendship and uh, a chemistry with a co-star. I think that's important yeah. for a believable yeah. uh, story to be told. Um, but I'm, I'm just very, I put up boundaries. I put up boundaries and, uh, and es essentially any sort of physical intimacy becomes like choreography yeah. mm -hmm. when you're acting. I think I always just yeah. wonder that because you look at Hollywood and they yeah. can't hold a marriage together to save their totally. life. Totally, yeah. And, and Everybody does it well. You just wonder, well, it's like, well, it's super attractive person A with super attractive person B right. and we're in a scene and it's like, that's just, that's a real craft to be yeah. able to cut that off and I wonder and sometimes. Continuing to that. prioritize your marriage. And yeah, you know? that is one thing that yeah. we've done, and, and I really appreciate this about you, but you've introduced me to your co-stars. We, we, we make yeah. sure to get our families and their families together yeah. to make sure that, that communication is there, respect is there, um, you know what I mean, honesty and yeah. all. So yeah. a lot of boundaries. You yeah. Know. So that's how it starts with a kiss. <laughs> that is surprising. A showmance, we <laughs> yeah. call it. Yeah. yeah, that's cool. All right, so life is good. I mean, like this, the, sure. the, the photography studio is hopping. Yep. You're going show to show. You're getting, you get Tony nominated. I mean, like, this is the dream. And, and, and so that's all happening. And then the thing happens that seemed to change the world for everybody on a macro and on a micro level. Mm -hmm. COVID hits. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what happens next? Yep. COVID starts to happen. What do you see starting to happen in your, your world? Sure. Um, our industry, the entire entertainment industry, completely shut down because theater specifically is about large groups of people coming together and singing, <laughs> which were two things that were just not uh, encouraged during yep. that time yep. and very looked down upon. And so uh, it was scary, if I'm gonna be honest. I, I remember having a whole season of anxiety of what am I gonna do and how are we gonna pay for the things? And, mm -hmm. um, and then the, the theater community got very creative about ways to continue to be artistic and then felt a great responsibility to help entertain people and get them through this really hard mm -hmm. time in the world. And I started doing virtual concerts for my house. I started yeah. teaching and coaching over Zoom to all the musical theater students whose schools were canceled and musicals were canceled. And, um, you were doing that for hours a day. Yeah, I mean, it was, and I was so grateful was no to shortage. have a little bit of income and a little bit of purpose, mm -hmm. I think, during that time. Um, and recording a little bit. I recorded a whole uh, concept album of a musical in, my, in our closet during COVID, and they sent me equipment. And I just think I was actually quite inspired by the creative ways that the entertainment industry uh, started to create art again. Around it. But you say you were scared mainly for the career, mainly for what it was doing to you, Broadway and what it was doing, but, but were you also early on kind of worried about the pandemic? I mean, well, I think because people are in different yeah. places on that. Like for sure. I just had Jennifer say on and she's like, I never really quite bought the hype. Yeah. And I'm just you know, curious for yeah, you. Yeah, no, that's yeah, a great question. question. And I think, I think early on, we went up to Connecticut. We had a place up there on a lake and which was about the best place that we could. We're so spend. grateful to be there, out of yeah. the city. Out of yeah. the city, um, I was going fishing in the mornings. You know, it was it was wonderful. Yeah. In that, you know, but my business was shut down, right? So it was like this, it's this like really difficult time. I, I, no money coming in, lots of money going out, mm -hmm. but yet also it was nice to be up there. But I think the, um, we we had some people staying with us, and we're. We didn't necessarily agree on everything, and we're, and we're processing processing things mm -hmm. through different lenses. We're getting our information through different sources, mm -hmm. and so and, and, and at some point, um, it, it was weird to even talk about this stuff because you know we're, we're, there's you know you have uh, you have this this new uh, pandemic and this, this virus coming out, and, and you're not able to talk about the fact that yeah. it's. You know, I listen to your podcast, you know, talking about the third rail 
you know, subjects. It's like you're not able to talk about it being from possibly a, a lab. We you know weren't I mean? in the home with the people, that, with and, the friends that we were friends who didn't have right. a place to go. And we were like, come to our place. We we have a place in Connecticut. It's safe. But yeah, and I and I think that we couldn't bring up these topics. Yeah, we oh, these, so these were people that were coming over with a different point of view on yeah, this thing. Yeah. So to even violate the airspace around the idea that right. it might be a lab leak. Yeah, there might be. You know, just might, very quickly. Any of these things. Yeah, we and have the conversation. And, and we love those people, but it was just we realized there's so many things right now, and there's so much stuff in the air that you're like it's that SNL sketch remember they were like careful <laughs> yes. 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 we're yes. starting to go near the totally old trip wire and just yep. to yep. keep the peace we just kind of didn't go there for a while yeah. and but I think I, it, it was it was interesting though as, as this is all happening I think at the beginning we were we yes we were like scrubbing our oranges yeah. and we had our, our disinfectant table and we had that, that yeah. yeah and then all of a sudden you start to realize that there's inconsistencies in, in, in a lot of things that are happening at that time. Yeah. And you're kind of like, can I actually trust the voice of the person that's telling me what's happening right now? And I, yeah, I think at some point we started to go, I, I actually don't, I don't know that, that the, the, what I'm being sold is actually true. And, and I, like I actually, we had, we had to start doing some of our own research and that's kind of where we, we found ourselves. Oh, you do your own research. Yeah, that yeah. was one of the things yeah, that yeah, said yeah. you should never do. Right, uh -huh. exactly. <laughs> but, okay, so I'm, I'm like you. That's my arc. Yeah. Same thing. But are you talking about it much? You said you didn't even really bring it up with people at this cabin, you know. With each other. With each other. All right. But you're not going on social media with that. No. No. You're okay. not going on social media with In that. In fact, I'm no. seeing everybody be quite outspoken on social media going like, okay, hmm. I've I sing and dance. It's not my responsibility to tell people what to do and right. how to think. And, uh, you know, so many people are feeling the need to advocate. Yeah. For I've mass never, or, or, or against or what? what For, uh, for any cause. Any uh, cause. You know, there was racial stuff happening sure. also in the summer of 2020. And uh, I just always felt like I'm just going to kind of stay out of it. I, I, and also learn. We were doing a lot of research. Oh, but, yes. You know, it was, it was a really unique time. It was like it was Trump. It was shutdowns. It was this fan pandemic. It was BLM. It was uh, masking. It was schools. The, and this is before yeah. vaccine stuff. But so it kind of was like, it was like every two weeks the news cycle was just like insane. Just being berated. Yeah. And so yes. we were just trying to go like, hey, let, let, what do we what do we think? What do we believe? Because you know, remember my business was shut down, and uh, you know after a few, three four months, you know we started going. Listen, this is not good. Like I had to let my employee go. Um, you know, I remember like a month in and it just, it was heartbreaking. I was like, I hate this. Like, why are we shutting down? Um, and I, you know, I, I think at first we understood it and then it just kind of stopped making sense at some point. So. so you have these questions and I think a lot of Americans did and yep. you're not even going out on social media. I just want to point that out because I think it's important to say it's not like you guys are trying to be cantankerous, no. frictional kind of people that are going out there and you know, poking the ribs on social media. That's not who you are. Mm -hmm. This is what's interesting because again, I, I, I mentioned Jennifer Say, the brand president of Levi's. You know, she checks all the boxes on what, in my opinion, makes a, a really great human being and yet this sort of to totalitarian impulse, mm -hmm. closed-mindedness, a way to think about every issue starts to, to come after people like her and eventually comes after people like you guys. You're right. not even interested in going into these spaces and yet it comes for you. So let's get to what starts to unfold, okay? So you're not talking about it, but you get an opportunity, is my understanding, and what happens, they, they ask you if you're vaccinated. Yes, I had agreed to do a one-night concert I uh, was getting paid a couple hundred dollars and had been testing a lot, had filmed two Hallmark movies during the pandemic. Um, and this one venue had was now deciding that they were going to implement a mandate for the vaccine. We hadn't yet been, been vaccinated. And so I, the, e the director had emailed everybody privately. I was very honest with her. I said, I'm not currently vaccinated. Guess I'll have to back out of this one. Love you. It was very amicable, private, lovely, easy, no big deal. And then a week later, there was an article in the New York Post saying that I was fired for refusing to be vaccinated and that my, my co-star had begged me for the sake of his children to be vaccinated and that I was vague about my status and kind of attacked, again, my character and that I was willing to put my coworkers at risk. We hadn't even started rehearsals yeah, none yet. None of that happened. And so this narrative really just took off. It seems like there was a firestorm of just all, all of these other outlets that picked up this article mm -hmm. and really ran with it at the time. And again, I, I, I was very quiet and private about the whole thing. And I, 
people who people wanted you to be outed if you were quiet or or if you didn't agree or weren't being an advocate is yeah, the silence the silence was violence. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that one. Silence yeah. is violence. Speech is violence. Right. Like actually it, no. No, actually it's no, not. It's not. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so did you even have a clue when you turned it down? Like we talked about these cultural tripwires. They're everywhere. Right. right? They're right. in language. Right. They're around racial things. They're around right. COVID. And we can all feel them when we're walking on eggshells all the time. Did you even suspect at all that when you said no, did you think you were maybe brushing up against a tripwire of any kind? I'll be honest and say no. In fact, I look back at that email exchange and part of me was like, should I have been honest? It's hard because honesty was actually punished in this situation. And I, I, we're, I try to be a person of character, a person of integrity. And I'm like, part of me is like, I could have been more the thing is, the narrative was that I was vague and I had lied, when actually I um, almost wish I, I would have been a little more vague and maybe this whole thing could have been prevented. I don't, it was all meant to be and there's silver lining in, yeah. in how this all happened and um, I'm still proudly unvaccinated. But like, it's just so crazy how the whole thing shifted and it became such a, a big thing. I did not realize or know. It's an observation I have of like wokeness is that it actually goes after integrity. It goes after, and I was talking, uh, again, I keep bringing up Jennifer because we just talked. Yes. Uh, but um, it goes after really what it wants is your obedience. Right. It doesn't even compliance. really matter what I'm telling you. It wants compliance. Yep. Right. That is yep. the goal. Yep. yep. And so, yeah, you, not being compliant is your crime. Right. Um, so then it starts to take on a life of its own. Is it, is it spinning out of control at this point? Oh, yeah. It is. It's oh, just starting yeah. to, fires are getting lit in the media and on social media. It was, yeah. it was, it was Immediate. fast. It was really fast. I mean, like, talk about, like, gasoline on a fire. And um, I think we were, we were literally <laughs> holding each other like, oh, for sure. what's going on right now? I mean, it's, it, it, it burned out It felt like fast. my life was a vase and someone took it and crashed and it shattered into a thousand pieces. And we, for a minute, we were just trying to, like, put the vase back together and we quickly realized that wasn't really like, an option. There's just too many leaks yeah, coming. Yeah. 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 Yep. And that, that actually, and yeah, I think that that was uh, very quickly we had, you had formulated a, a response and I think that that was the thing that, that was the, the final nail in the coffin as far as that goes. So about four days later, you took a little bit of time. Mm -hmm. We really were like, what do you, what do you want to say? What do we want to say through this? and apologizing and saying, I'm sorry, that was not in the cards. It was not in the you. option. No, well, and I want to hear about the Instagram response because yeah. okay. I think that's yeah. where it, but I also want to talk about just a little bit because I just want the audience to understand, I, I just did a monologue. I, I believe this cancel culture is coming for every single person in the cool. United States. Yeah. The vaccine was the next level of it, right? right. Where we're, right. Going to, we're going to force you to make choices because there's this, this, again, totalitarian impulse. When you run afoul of that thing I'm talking about, that thing that's gonna come for everybody that came for you, came for, for me, came for so many different people. Cancellation, it, it happens so fast that you're, it's like a moment of total confusion. Like you said, you're trying to put the vase back together. Completely. But it's got more and more leaks the more you do that. <laughs> It was, it was that, that was the experience for you. Like yeah. it's, it's just, it's shocking. It's like going through the windshield of your car. You're like, what just happened? Like a second ago, I had friends I had a life in New York. Um, it all made sense. There was no litmus test for my viability in, in the culture. You know, nobody was forcing me to do X or, mm -hmm. you know, this is America also. Right. right. And then, then everything just changes in one second. I mean, that's, that's how it was. For that's me. definitely it really what it felt yeah. like, for yeah. sure. Absolutely. And I think that, you know, you, you go through Twitter or you go through responses or direct messages or texts and you're like, the, the responses, you're just like, wait, are, are they talking about me? Are they talking about you? Are they talking about, wait, really? Like, cause this is, it's like, they know us. Like they know you, they know your character. And just to have that all questioned after one thing comes out. Yeah. Was it some of those people close friends? I mean, enough of them. It was a combination. Yeah, there were definitely some friends that were publicly hateful. And a lot of friends that reached out and said, I love you, I'm sorry this is happening, but you really should or whatever, you know, trying to kind of half, half hearted in how they cared. And the, the place where you found the most support was actually in the strangers. Because my case was made so public, mm -hmm. suddenly all these people that felt the same way but felt they couldn't say anything and were silenced, messaged me mm -hmm. and yes came out and yeah. 
we found a whole new community of people um, in the midst of all of this that um, are more like-minded and have felt the same way. Were you surprised, and I don't know, was, was there very many friends that spoke up, conversely? No. No, no. not really anybody. No. I that, think that, yeah, that was the hard thing, is that you're like, wait a second, nope, like, no, nobody? Like, I think a lot of people were afraid as we talked it. about. That's it was totally just it. the... But even now, will they speak up? Barely. For, I, I have, we have heard people, um, this is what I will say, we, people yes. have now come to you or come to me and said, hey, I, what, what happened? That was crazy and that was just not okay. We miss you guys or you're missed yeah. in New York. Yeah. Um, or, you know, I think there's been a little bit of that or, or some people that have reacted in a way that was very hurtful and they and they've they, there have been a couple people that have said people Listen, that have come back i'm so sorry i was a dick you know i was a jerk <laughs> yeah. you know what i mean and um or i and didn't I, I didn't know what to do with i that had moment. so I much thought fear I, that i didn't know what to do with it do. and you know what now that we're kind of past that I, I i can see more clearly and i'm so sorry and and that's i mean i think when those moments happen i mean that's a beautiful moment right yes. and that's when you say because we need to be yeah, accepting and forgive. we should get into that in a little Absolutely. bit too. But to heal, we have to be able to forgive people. Forgiveness, yeah. Because yeah. people did not, it was like a Twilight Zone episode where all the worst instincts came out of people during COVID. Right. Right. Um, so uh, backing up again, I kind of it's my fault. I'm kind of jumping out of order here. It's easy to go. <laughs> yeah, it is. But but uh, the Instagram post. So you you see the media, it's blowing up. It's start, the, the, the narratives are taking off. People are saying things. and And so you put out an Instagram post to try to quell the fire, what response. happens and what does it basically say, roughly? Sure, I just felt I needed to craft a response to correct the narrative of the events that actually happened okay. leading up to me being leaving this one job um, and then also not apologize. I felt like I, I hadn't done anything wrong and I, my response was like, everyone should have the freedom to choose what is right mm -hmm. for them. And we consulted our doctors and we thought about it and came to the conclusion and that this is... You already had COVID too, right? I hadn't actually well, had at the had moment. Okay. And I yeah. had been working <laughs> pretty regularly. But you still are like, it's still my body and I don't want to put right. that in my body. Yes, I Does think... Does that still work for anybody? <laughs> I know, I know. There were several reasons for us. You know, I think a lot of people, if for anyone that made this decision, there were just so many assumptions that got put on right. them that if I made this decision, then I also believe this, 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 and this, Trumper. and I deserve you're to a, die. You're a xenophobe, yes. you're a racist, right. you're yes. a, whatever the things are. Yeah. And so I, f I just felt the need to go, hey, that, that's so not the case. This is just, and it was worth it for me to give up a one night concert, to just wait a little longer and for us to learn a little bit more and continue to do research. and. Once this all happened, I did feel, that's when I actually felt the need to like kind of double down and, and really take a stand. Um, I didn't want to be someone that caved just because, in order to save face or um, got a fake card to keep working. Again, integrity and, and character. And no judgment. I think people have been put in impossible situations where they have families. And so for people that, um, Got it. Did or, choose to get the vaccine or, or got a fake card or something, you know, like everybody has to make those calls and they've got to, they got to, you know what I mean? Well, like there's my, my question is, and we've talked a lot about this is, is like, why did it suddenly go from live and let live in America to just in a flash? Yeah, for sure. And then the rationale for it, I mean, I felt like like 90% of America missed logic class in, in college. <sighs> Explain to me how you, you're vaccinated, right? right? You're vaccinated. How am I a threat to you? Because the thing is safe and effective. It's right. effective. Right. So how am I going right. to hurt you? I could never, yeah, there's no. these weird explanations, but I never felt like anybody could ever really explain that. Right. It didn't make sense. And, anyone, and I th yeah. yeah. And I think that there, at some point, it wasn't about making sense. It was about right. your loyalty. And it was compliance. about and compliance. And that's where I think, to me, it took, there was a leap of faith that they were asking for. And I'm like, I, I got it. Sorry, I, I just saw what happened the last year. And I have so many question marks. Yeah. So forgive me for wanting to hold on a second because I don't really, I don't know if I trust you. Do you know what I'm saying? No, like, I know. Yes. And I think, and so, I, I feel like the faster the conversation is being told it has to be had and the quicker we arrive at a conclusion, the more I'm starting to think that something's wrong. Right. Uh -huh. Because this is, I, the more I'm feeling gaslit, we're right. moving too fast. Yeah. And we're not right. allowing people to ask honest, reasonable questions. Right. Yeah. And anyone that did was silenced, deplatformed, canceled. 
So that also begins to make you wonder, is mm -hmm. there an agenda? Is the, what, What's the narrative that's being put out there where any, any stance that wants to just wait or ask a question right. is quickly... We've got to be able to talk about things. We've got to be able to be open about it because that's sure. how we... That's how we get to the best ideas, too. I know. Do you know what I mean? So I, that's why I think these conversations are valuable. I think these, I think other conversations between people that don't agree, they're valuable. Like, and to we me, were, that's America. We were entrenched like, in a community that maybe that doesn't agree with right. us for 15 right. years. I was like, I felt a called to love things. to love yeah. that industry and love all the people I was working with. Yeah. And then it was like the minute this thing happened, it was like, nope, you you can't belong here. You can't sit with us anymore. <laughs> but then think about, again, wokeness, what does it do? It's designed to shut the conversation right. down. Right. You just said that in order to move forward, we actually need to be able to do this. Right. Like, yeah. a, like a family, like if you had a dysfunctional Absolutely. family, what's the thing the psychologist is going to tell you or your pastor is going to tell you? You guys need to talk. Right. You need to have some honest right. conversation. Yes. That's what Dr. Phil would tell you. That's what anybody <laughs> would tell you, right? Right. Yeah. And instead, wokeness is saying, actually, stop the conversation. Right. Exactly. Less conversation. It's like, no, 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 no. We need more conversation. Yes. How dare Absolutely. you want to have a yes. conversation? Sure. So the Instagram post doesn't quell anything. It, no. It right. gets worse. <laughs> and, and that is another thing about wokeness. The more you try to explain, right. the more you're explaining and it doesn't do anything, which right. is why I love that you didn't apologize. I think you sense that pretty quickly if you have a little bit of wits about you, which mm -hmm. is you're about to be extorted. And yep. anything you, the, the, the apology just makes you a captive. And now once you, once you say sorry, guess what? They're back for more. You, you'll be on Broadway, right. but you're going to be their puppet for whatever's next. Absolutely. And I think I knew with that response, I, I, didn't, I knew I wasn't gonna change anybody's mind. My response was just like, this is the choice we are making and I should be allowed to do that. And I'm all for safety. I have been testing regularly. I'm willing to quarantine. I'm willing to do basically any anything you else want. you would want me to do to still work. But you know, it was again because of this one thing. Yeah, and I think that allowed. they. I, I think that was New, New York's an interesting place, and and Broadway. We we've had so many great relationships over the years mm -hmm. there, but I think that there was that moment where if you didn't go along with it, it's like okay, oh, you're not with us. You chose, you're, you're not choosing our team. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and it's not like, I, I just felt like it was, it was this signal almost that when we didn't get vaccinated or when we didn't want, it just was like, oh, you're, you're done. Like you're dead to us. And, and I, I don't know, that's how I felt. Yeah, and the, this was before a lot of other sports stars or yeah, yeah. anybody else had, had really yeah. come out. So I think no, we didn't, there wasn't any narrative around the people who were unvaccinated. Mm -hmm. And so we were trying to come up with language or whatever. And then the more people started to come out and be bold in that and get canceled for it, but hold their ground and have a little bit of fortitude and a backbone in the midst of it, we were inspired by that courage. Yeah, and I think sure. that's only allowed us to continue yeah. to grow in our courage and hope that we can also be an inspiration to other artists who, who have been silenced, as I started sure, to say. Sure. It's been a very interesting journey. Please like and subscribe to The Big Picture. It'd mean a lot to me. And don't miss part two of my interview with Laura Osnes and Nathan Johnson. They're gonna talk about what life looks like after cancellation and what role their Christian faith plays in that. You're gonna love it. I think you're gonna be encouraged. Please join me for part two of that interview.